there is no red without blue, right? If there is no one defending the castle walls, I mean, Owen is the prize fighter. I'm just the sparring partner, right? So being able to collaborate directly and see that impact and see those detections being built. And like Owen said, you know, hey, we think we, we found something here. Should we run a playbook on this? And okay, that's, that's adversary simulation or that's red team or whatever, you know, uh, how we're running the exercise. Seeing that impact and then seeing that, okay, cool. We've transferred the crystallization of that knowledge to now the seam or like the blue team. And they're able to identify those things in the wild. They know what to hunt for. They know how to, you know, oh, this looks bad. Oh, uh, well, is it one thing or is it a chain of things, et cetera, et cetera. So seeing that impact, I mean, that's huge. And it really validates the work. Hello, and welcome back to the Cybrary Podcast. I'm your host, Will Carlson, Senior Director of Content here at Cybrary. And you know what? I lucked out. I get to be joined again today by Matt and Owen for part two of our podcast, really leaning into the work we've been doing on threat actor campaigns and why the general approach is really important and valid for cybersecurity teams and professionals uh, you know, uh, in the field at large and in general. And Welcome back, Matt and Owen. Quick introductions for anybody that may have missed the previous episode so they know who you are and kind of where you sit. Sure. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, defensive SME here at Cybrary, um, uh, primarily on the defensive end, you know, in my professional career so far um, in the private sector, um, you know, primarily running, you know, SIMs and, and endpoint detection solutions. Um, yeah, everything, everything blue team. Go blue. Right on. And uh, I'm Matt Mullins. Uh, I'm a adversary emulation SME here at Cybrary. And uh, kind of like Owen, I'm the other side of the coin. So majority of my career has been emulating the bad guys and gals and trying to steal the crown jewels. So red team operations, adversary simulation, emulation, things of that nature. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's great. Thank you both. Um, that's going to be a fun conversation. And I would like to start out by asking, you know, generally... Whether we love the term or we hate the term, I think we'll find opinions on both sides, and they tend to be a little <laughs> polarized, as does a lot seemingly these days. But I think it's safe to call this generally a purple team exercise. Would either of you object to that, or do we largely align to that kind of application of the term for what we're going to be talking about today? Oh, yeah, totally. I agree, too. I mean, you, you got both sides of the house mixing together. Beautiful shade of purple. <laughs> That's right. I, I wonder, <laughs> generally for you both, um, what benefits from your seats, both on the, the offensive and the defensive side, what are the benefits of, of partnering and pairing this way that you don't get if you don't do that? Why do this? Yeah, I mean, I can start uh, from the defensive side. You really, I mean, you get to, you know, ask the questions. Um, some of the stuff that comes through in your SIM or uh, any of your uh, security tools, it may not be as obvious as to what's happening. Um, and you have that outlet to be able to, to reach out and say, hey, did you just do this? Or, it, it, you know, what am I seeing here? You know, and really just try to, you know, fine tune and understand what may be happening um, to just, you know, strengthen your posture. Yeah, uh, just to, to build on Owen's point, I mean, it's from from the adversary simulation side. Obviously, we get to improve our trade craft. We get to see the direct impact of what we're we're doing and how that's going to benefit the enterprise, the organization, and that's huge, right? Because at the end of the day, and I think we touched on this in the last podcast, there is no there is no red without blue, right? If there is no one defending the castle walls, I mean, Owen is the prize fighter. I'm just the sparring partner, right? So being able to collaborate directly and see that impact and see those detections being built. And like Owen said, you know, hey, we think we, we found something here. Should we run a playbook on this? And okay, that's, that's adversary simulation or that's red team or whatever, you know, uh, how we're running the exercise. Seeing that impact and then seeing that, okay, cool. We've transferred the crystallization of that knowledge to now the seam or like the blue team. And they're able to identify those things in the wild. They know what to hunt for. They know how to, you know, oh, this looks bad. Uh, well, is it one thing or is it a chain of things, et cetera, et cetera. So seeing that impact, I mean, that's huge and it really validates the work. That's great. I wonder, Matt, maybe this is a question for you, but I, I, in my experience, this is a little bit in partnership with the blue team as well. But how does a, an adversary team come in and decide who to emulate? Yeah, sure. That's that's a great question. So obviously a lot of, actually the majority of everything is going to be cyber threat intelligence driven. So with that being said, I mean, 
when we're building our kind of like our dossier or our report for like how many groups we have to be worried about for the year or in the six months or whatever the cadence is that has been deemed necessary. I mean, things to consider, right? Are they, are they attacking in the space that we preside in as an enterprise? So if we're a financial technology company, are they attacking technology? Are they attach, attacking financial services? Are they attacking fintech in general? Those are usually a pretty good first starting point. And then after that, I mean, the, another thing to look at is what's the reporting and the intelligence in regards to, you know, their attacks in the sector? Like, have they attacked people that we do business with? Or maybe we have like exposed APIs to or things like that, because that's getting a little bit closer to the crown jewels or, you know, uh, our organization. And then another thing to consider, too, is, is capabilities, right? So if we are, uh, you know, a Fortune 1 company or whatever, you know, like obvious exaggeration, um, but um, say we have the best of the best defense, you know, there's some adversary groups that we're probably not super worried about, right? So very low sophistication, uh, low capability. They might have the, the motivation, um, but they don't really have the, the means, per se, to attack us effectively. And so we might not be worried about that as much as we might be worried about, um, you know, advanced persistent threat actors associated with nation state threat actors, right? Or nation state groups. Um, so something crazy like a Lazarus group coming in might be a little bit more of a concern versus like, you know, Bob and the ransomware boys. So <laughs> that, that's probably the, the the best first approach when it comes to uh, adversary emulation side and, and then that cyber threat intelligence drive. So Matt, the, the team looks at the, the CTI reports, what's actually going on, what's moving in the wild, and they'll come up with a recommendation. Um, and that just means Owen doesn't have to worry about any of that, right, Owen? Or <laughs> that's, that's probably not it, right? So, I mean, you have to know a number of things to make sure that the campaign or that the the exercise is going to be beneficial from a defensive perspective. So, you know, as you would step into one of these things, you know, what are you hoping to get out of it? Why is why is the approach important to you? How how do you want to inform the the campaign that gets picked and who they're emulating? Yeah. So essentially, I mean, obviously, going off of all of Matt's points as well, but I think also too, there's something to say about trends as well. Uh, obviously, you're, you're going to want to tailor it to, you know, what's going to, you know, best have the best impact and what could affect us the most. Um, but also, and I mean, just think about in the past year or two with the supply chain attacks, right? There's been a, quite a handful of them. You know, you kind of have to, to look at, okay, where's the trends in the, in the industry going? And who are those, you know, adversaries that can actually carry out those trends at a high level? You know, and, and then that way you can whittle it down to the the few that may be, you know, most targeted towards your exact business per industry, you know, and per size and, and whatever else. Um, but that's definitely a, a factor that I would take into consideration. I think it really is interesting too, right? So the difference between, and we picked on our our, our favorite pen tester, Clint Kerr, a little bit at the last episode. <laughs> so why not continue the trend, right? Um you know, Pentester comes in, they're really noisy, they have a, a very defined set of objectives oftentimes, um, and they just do their engagement. And I think some in the industry, their experience with pen tests is they're the really loud group that comes in and breaks things and leaves and leaves a report on your desk about all this stuff that you need to fix. So it's not really oftentimes perceived as a partnership. And I wonder, in my experience, what I've seen with Purple Team in particular is it really is leaning into a different way of doing that, right? So I've seen some people say pen tests where the pen testers work closely with the blue team. They call those purple team engagements. And I don't know that that's a wrong, uh, necessarily a wrong characterization, but I think the more pure characterization is what we're talking about today, right? Where you have an, somebody coming in who's going to emulate an adversary, but it's not that they just get to come in and pick whatever adversary they think they're good at or that they want to do. They've really got to align with the defensive side of things, right? And know mm -hmm. what are your crown jewels? Who are you concerned about? What are your business objectives? How big are you to your point, Matt, about capabilities? And it really is from the very beginning, a cooperative exercise. Otherwise, the adversary team can come in, model something that the defensive team really doesn't care anything about. Yep. Um, so it's about partnering early, early on in the process, not just later and dropping a report and, and, and walking out, um, as we know Clint likes to do. I'm kidding. Clint's <laughs> a consummate professional, but he's easy to needle because he's not here, and I'll, I'll hear about it later. <laughs> um, I, I wonder, in both of your experiences, I guess I kind of already called one out. I tipped my hand to my next question, but are there any anti-patterns? So some ways that these kinds of engagements just do not work well, or some things to watch out for if you're thinking about doing this or, or trying to get organizational buy-in to an approach similar to this? What are some things that would not work well? 
I, I can start with, I know there, there's one from the blue side that really can go sour if it's not called out quickly enough. And that's if you're planning on, okay, maybe it's a surprise purple team, right? Where you want to actually test the initial detection capabilities of your, your blue team. Um, but you never actually tell your blue team once they've detected it. You know what I'm saying? You never let them in on the gig that, hey, we're actually yeah. doing an exercise. That can be a bad thing, you know, because you could you could strain your team for a couple of days, not letting them in, thinking that, oh, I'm going to, you know, let the red team get as far as they can um, with the intent of bringing in the blue team at some point. Uh, but it really it, it kind of instills a, a mindset of distrust, um, yeah. you know, leaves leaves you a little sour um, with your leadership if you do it that way. It's I mean, it's good to test the initial detection. Don't get me wrong. I think that's a great idea. Um, but once they detect it, you know, you got to let them in like, OK, great. You did great. You detected them. You were going to prevent them. But let's hold off because surprise, we're we're doing a, a pen test and we want this to be, a, you know, a collaborative event now. So that, that's one that I've seen and experienced that um, it can really wear on on the blue team if you don't let them in on it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's a great point. And like, you know, one thing to consider too with that is, is, is the morale. I really want to underscore that because if if you're coming in, especially as a purple team or even as a red team, like a pure red team where there's no optics and you've got a white cell and like it's just like someone whispering over their shoulder like, hey, run your playbook, don't spin up like an incident but you know, just do your thing. Like even that has to be collaborative to your point, Owen, because if it's not, then again, you're going to drive down the morale. And I've definitely seen in organizations where the blue team is just, they go to the readouts for the red team and it's like a public execution, you know, like they're just like, all right, here we go. Right. It's going to be another public beating. And like, that is the worst. It doesn't accomplish anything. I mean, it, you can, really you can prove initial detection, and that's really all that you're going to get from that. Besides, like you said, a, a public execution of yeah. of just shaming them like, oh, you didn't detect it here. You didn't detect it here. It's like, OK, well, we know that we need to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one other thing, too, I was going to throw out there is that when we think about the cyber threat intelligence side of it, I mean, that's super critical to good adversary emulation and simulation. Right. Um you know, when we were thinking about anti-patterns earlier, we kind of mentioned anti-patterns as a question. One thing that stands out in my mind, too, is the identification of groups that have the capability and the means, but there's no consideration to the motivation, right? So why would you build a profile around, you know, APT group, you know, 42 or 22 or 13 or whatever, and like, there's no critical analysis of what's the motivation for it. Yeah, do they they have the capability. They have attacked financial technology, you know, instances or enterprises before. But oh, one thing, thing that we missed is their their the, the organization is is government oriented and they're one of the United States allies or something like that, right? So there's no motivation. The capability is there. They have the means and the capability, but they don't have any motivation. And so, you know, that's, again, CTI being the driver for all good exercises. And then the other part of it, obviously, being like what Owen said, it has to be truly purple. If it's going to be a purple team, blue team should not feel like you're going to like sucker punch them because like Owen said, we really want to underscore that again, that trust and that rapport makes it so much better. Like you want, you want an organization where the red team put strings in their malware that like pokes fun. And then like you laugh and joke about it, maybe like in the readouts, you don't want an organization where it's again, a public execution or, or the inverse is, is the, the blue team has been demoralized so much that once they get the red team once, then they're like, Oh, we got the flag. Ha 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 ha. Rub it in your face. And then the red team is like, Oh, now we're going to take off the kid gloves. And now we're going to really get you because that's the opposite of what we want. Right. It's a <laughs> right. emulation simulation exercise. We want to train the blue team to be the best. They're, they are the protectors of the castle. If they can't do their job effectively, we have failed as adversary simulation or red team. I think it's interesting too, right? In my opinion, um, when things go that way, it can oftentimes be because the primary objective has gone out of focus. Matt, to your point, like the primary objective is not to smear the blue team. The primary objective is to partner and to better protect the organization, to know what our weak spots are, know where we need to improve, know what we can detect, and to do so as best as possible in a prioritized way. And I think if you keep that in focus, it 
really eliminates and alleviates some of that mm-hmm. and prevents some of the toxic culture that can happen around these events. Because Matt, I mean, Matt, you, you said it really well. Like you're a sparring partner to make sure that Owen is ready to respond when he steps into the ring with the real adversary, right? It's in the title. You're an adversary emulator. You're not the adversary. And I think yeah. when, when these events and these exercises are allowed to get to that point, you, you've summarily lost focus on what the real objective is, and that's to better secure the organization and to improve your security posture. Yep. And I mean, that may be a good differentiator, truthfully, is are you trying to, you know, are you trying to learn against a, an, an exact adversary or are you just trying to test to see what vulnerabilities are exploitable across the board? Because the, if you go that second route, I mean, that could go, you could go anywhere, you know, that yeah. that'll lead you down rabbit holes. Right. And you could not that you can't learn from that. Um, but if you're really trying to to true up your defenses, you know, doing it hand in hand you know, being able to, to, to see the events live as they come through is really more beneficial than, you know, getting beat down and then having to go back and, and try to retrace everything. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I think too, Matt, you know, it, it's easy to, and I think people's general uh, impression of these exercises is that the red team is going to come in and, and not school the blue team, but point some things out to the blue team, teach the blue team some things, but the red team never learns from these engagements, right? I mean, you're always the teacher. Yeah, that's the, that's definitely not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that, that we can pick up from just one engagement, right? You know, again, there's things that are, are, I'm not beating the dead horse, but like culturally you can pick up from just one readout, right? So you might be a brand new operator on a team and you go to a readout and like you can read the room, just that can be a learning message because if you're not conveying the knowledge appropriately, well, you know, the other thing is too, is understanding and learning how to be a better adversary in your environment, kind of dovetailing off of that. Right. So we might know that this is the detection technology. And then you go in to your purple team exercise and you don't think about it. And you're like, Oh, well, you know, we know that they're using product X and I'm going to quickly Google some bypasses for product X, and then we just throw that out there. Well, if you're emulating an actual adversary, is the adversary going to have that knowledge within the organization prior? Like, you know, so there's there's the chicken and the egg problem in that sense, right? And I mean, there's, there's little small things on top of the stuff that you could pick up from just the TTPs and the detections and things like that so that you can better emulate things. Um, and I say emulate more precisely because sometimes when you go in and you have like your dossier and you have your, you know, your miter mapping, your smorgasbord of stuff, we know potentially with like a purple team, like Owen and company, they have great detections for MS build or something like that. Right. So we know we can't use MS build in the environment. We, they've got rules wrote for it. They got Sysmon, they've got all that stuff, right. It's great. Um, so maybe we need to lean more towards the side of simulation to make the exercise beneficial because going back to that sparring partner, uh, conversation point, if we're too easy of a sparring partner and the actual enemy that comes into the ring is like Mike Tyson. And then it's, it's like, they've been sparring with me and I'm like, no comparison, you know, like Owen's going to take some shots and we don't want that. Right. So we need to make sure that we stretch them appropriately, um, and engage them appropriately in, that's iterative, right? It's, it's wolves and deer coevolution, you know, like we have to stay up with the blue team to make sure we're challenging the blue team, but that goes backwards too. And there's a promise that I'll end the the bunny trail that I'm on right now. But like, if we go too hard early and we get to the more, the, the, the morale and the beat down problem, if we go too light, blue team doesn't get everything out of the exercise. So it's got to be closely tied to it. And that comes from good readouts, good communication and learning from the blue team in the organization. Sorry, and rant. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. I think another interesting pattern that I've seen here too is um, effectively repeating the same exercise multiple times, right? So you come in, the red team does their business. It was not great. Stop short of a bloodbath. Blue team gets to go go home, put pen to paper, do their homework, put in some new detections, and we're going to run it again and see what we did. So this concept of constantly improve, improving and evolving, it's not that you have to 
you know, go out and cover all the adversaries that you possibly could and see how bad you are. It's again, it's this process of, of constant improvement. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you go out and the, the blue team wins and the red team just sucks, well, <laughs> red team, red team gets to go do the same, right? Well, you got to go do your homework. You got to do this a little bit harder next time, because the point is really to, I think, find that balance between we want to constantly be learning and improving, but we also, again, we don't want to demoralize the team and make them think that they're just totally ineffective because when that real event comes in and they've had three failed attempts with the adversary emulation team, are they just going to throw their hands up and walk away from the terminals? That doesn't do the organization any good either. So I think there's a fair bit of nuance, which again, rolls back to coordinating early in the process and the planning to make this all work really well. I wonder... Uh, in both your experiences, you know, once the team has agreed to what the emulation is going to look like, and maybe for the sake of argument, we talk about an engagement where we kind of know who we're emulating. We're just mm -hmm. testing. We want to see, can we detect this adversary because they are moving in our space? Um, how should the blue team prepare? Should they go in blind? Should they go, okay, we're going to try to detect this particular adversary. Let's go to work, seeing that we're ready. Um, you know, what have you seen? What have you found that works well? I, I think from the the defensive side, it is good to initially see, um, you know, what what you can see out of the box. Whatever, you know, I, depending on your your sim setup and, and your tool setup, you know, you may have some detections already built. Maybe you just imported what they had, um, but it is good to be able to baseline and say, okay, we've seen this, but we didn't see everything else, right? Um, and that also, you know, in preparing for that exercise, having a good understanding of your detection uh, tooling is, is a good thing to have. You know, you, you don't want to be learning how to use your tool during the exercise. You should have somebody on staff that can create rules, that can, you know, add a data source if you just you realize, you know, we're missing something. Um, I mean, that would be another thing to prepare is ensure that you have all your data sources as required. Um, you know, without visibility uh, or, or extra data to bring into cor create correlations, um, you you may just miss things that just because you don't have the the logs there, um, you know. And then um, to, uh, also having another thing that may you know tailor into the red team a little bit is um, just because you have a sim in place doesn't mean like you're golden, right? You got to have those assurances that it's working properly. So like your agents or your collectors that you have out there in the wild, you have to have assurances on those that, you know, when it goes down, when it comes back up, it, you know, if it's being restarted, I mean, worst case scenario emulator or, a, a, you know, adversary emulator comes in, knows that you're using Splunk as, and goes out there and, and is able to restart your collector while he does his business and you have zero visibility there and it looks like to you if you don't have any of that alerting set up to let you know that hey your collector went down everything looks normal to you and meanwhile he's running in the dark so um and then obviously understanding your company's risks goals gaps things like that ahead of time um it, it is it's good to have on on the forefront for sure yeah, and on the, the point that you made about the baseline, Owen, I mean, that is so true, right? Because especially if you're doing like your first engagement for one of these, uh, you know, purple team exercises, you got to know where you're starting from, right? Yep. So, I mean, that that is uh, paramount. And then also understanding technology stack again. <laughs> and I've seen that in the field where individuals have a new product or, you know, when cloud was rolling out, everyone's like, oh, everything goes to the cloud. Wait, what do we do with the cloud? How do we secure the cloud? You know, and then it's just like, you know, shooting fish in a barrel or fanning the hammer and being like, well, what did I hit? All right, let's, let's tag them and bag them. Right. And like, it's not a good, it's not a good position to be in. And it's super frustrating for the real defenders, you know, as a response blue team, because, you know, like, Oh, we got this new product. Oh, by the way, we have a purple team exercise or a red team exercise. It's like black box scheduled for next week. Let the fun yeah. begin. Like, that's not fair to blue team. Right. So having that baseline to Owen's point is super important. And clear communication as well on the blue side. I think there's like a stigma with, with the word pen test or penetration test where it's like, oh, this is to test initial detection. I mean, it really does come down to what is the capabilities of the blue team. But there's a stigma of like, if we don't catch it, we're in trouble type thing, right? Yeah. It just, it inherently has, I don't know where it came from, but there needs to be clear communication up to leadership channel that, hey, this is happening. It is a working exercise that it's it's a two you know two way street. So if we don't detect something or we don't detect anything, it's okay because we're going to learn from it and then you know grow and improve. 
Um, I mean, that's just kind of how you have to approach it that way. Other ways, you got your blue team guys that are that are you know hands deep there, um, just nervous and. You know, they then they may actually miss things because they're not actually performing as they should be because they think they should, you know, be seeing something already. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point, especially with the initial like vector slash the initial breach beachhead, you know, into the organization. I mean, we look at like antivirus EDR, we look at you know web portals uh, or um, email portals where they'll take like a link and they'll sandbox and stuff like that. All that technology is really good, right? But there are ways around it. Can confirm. Yep. And they're done that got the, got the t-shirt. So to your point about like, hey, blue team, it's okay if you don't catch them. We This is where you want to fail. Yes. You know, like there's a yes. martial arts quote that I'd heard before when I was training when I was younger. And it was like, you want to go to the dojo with the mentality that you're going to die many times in the dojo. So you don't actually die when you're in combat. Right. And like, that's the mentality that like ad sim should bring or adversary simulation or the red team. Right. So we want to come in and we want to set this setup or set this setup. That was good English. We want to have this setup so that, you know, they're not afraid to fail. They fail now. So then when it comes to the actual adversary, they're like, oh, this is just like training day, you know? And so that mentality is so important because to your point, what I was going off of with the original initial vector with phishing and things like that, most of the time, those things are almost like magic tricks, right? You find a bypass that works. If it works, there's probably no detection and there's probably a total like clear cut right to a C2 connection to a host. And now you have your breach. Yep. You know, people can be trained to not click things, but people are people, right? They're yep. going to make mistakes and they oh, shouldn't they be drug out publicly executed for that as well. And so hunting the TTPs based off of the CTI report, knowing what you're looking for and to Owen's point, not freaking out your blue teamers to think that they can't go hunting and looking for things or, you know, oh, this alert fired, let me investigate that they should be relaxed. They should have a good vibe when they're at work and they should be like, Hey, I'm a pro. I do my thing. And I, and I have room to learn, but it should never be like you were saying, Owen, like, Oh man, I got to catch, got to catch red team. Cause if I don't catch red team, then my boss is going to think I'm dumb and I don't want right. to be the dumb guy. You know, it's okay to be the dumb guy. I've been there too. <laughs> I also think some of this has to do with organizational maturity too, right? So the the comment I was going to make as an anti-pattern earlier was about you you probably don't want to come in with CTI about an adversary that your team has never heard about or that you've never prepared for in any way. It's like you're just setting them up to fail, right? So then you go to the readout and it's like, oh, we were emulating this adversary that we've never heard of. That Yeah, they play in our space, but we never took the time to put any detections in place whatsoever. So you got it handed to you. We all effectively wasted our time and now everybody feels bad. I can see a world where, though, potentially that, you know, if you're a really sophisticated organization and you've done all the basic block and tackle, and it is more of a test, right? It is more of a, we're going to go in and we're going to beat each other up a little bit and see if we can get this done. But I think my my argument would be that that's the exception to the rule that, you know, I would say it's a pretty strong anti-pattern to be pulling in CTI for a, a threat group that you've never talked about, never built detections for, just knowing that the emulation team is going to hand it to the blue team. You're just yeah. setting the exercise up to fail. And again, yeah. playing into that truly adversarial nature um, between both sides. So yeah. Yeah, I think you need to you, you need to lean into these exercises for things, Owen, to your point, that that the team at least has some awareness of and they've done something um, to put yep. detections in because it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to realize that, yeah, they can get into your house if they use a bulldozer and we never prepared or built a house for that, right? What we were trying right. to do, we were preparing <laughs> for somebody that's going to do a smash and grab and we wanted to detect them. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. One thing I was going to throw out there too uh, that you called out, Will, is that there's a time and a place for like harder training. You know, running off the martial arts analogy, you know, if you're training for a fight, you know, like an you know, amateur, or like a smoker or something like that, you don't do a ton of hard sparring typically until you're right before your fight, you know, and maybe it's, it's slowly metered up accordingly. Because if you just go in there and you just beat the snot out of the person who's brand new and is trying to, you know, go into their first competition, it goes back to Owen's point. They're going to be gun shy. They're going to be like, oh, man, I'm going to get clobbered. I don't really want to – I don't want to make the wrong move. And then, you know, they can't operate as effectively. So those have to be saved, to your point, Will, um, for a real – hey, this is a high sophistication red team engagement. They're going to attack everything, you know, physicals in scope in-person social engineering, vishing is in scope, blah, 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 blah. Now you have these crazy vectors outside of just standard initial access that, that no one probably doesn't have any hook into, right? 
Vishing is a great example, right? So most organizations that I have have worked for or, or engaged with or did some sort of assistance with, you know, you ask them about vishing, they're like, oh yeah, um, we're aware of vishing. There's a CBT on it. And then you're like, well, what's the process for reporting a suspicious call? Is there anything that you guys do in regards to that? Or is no? Oh, okay. Well, that's just like we could just go all day calling people up. Hey, <laughs> can I have your password, please, good sir? Someone is going to be like, seems legit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah. is Matt from Tech Support. I'm noticing a problem with yeah. your workstation. I really need to fix that remotely. But in order to do so, I'll need the password to your machine. Could you please yeah. give that to me? And then oh, they yeah, say, sure. It has been going a little slow lately. <laughs> yeah. My boss is pressing me for this report by the end of the day. So if you could help me get that running better, that'd be great. Oops. <laughs> Never pull the report you. for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bam. I think it's interesting too. You both have alluded to this, right? In that, um, <laughs> if if the security program and the detections are built well, right? We, you know, uh, tried and true term of defense in depth. I think even within, you know, oh, in your world of things, it's very much that way, right? You don't necessarily have to detect them at initial access. We would love to. We would love right. to prevent them at initial access. But, you know, I, I think, th thankfully, hopefully, the industry is really moving away from this walled garden, just prevent everybody and moving much more to the assumed breach posture. And certainly, yeah. we'd like to keep people out altogether. But the reality is, is that we need to know if they are. And we need mm -hmm. to be able to look back and do all of the forensic post analysis to see, you know, oh, and you and I have talked about this before, candidly, in relation to this threat campaign that we recently worked on. And that's that you may not see that initial access. You may, you're, you may be relying on that email filter to catch it, and it doesn't catch this one thing. But yep. if you don't catch them after that, then you've really got trouble. But right. what may happen is that you may catch them three techniques into their campaign, and then you're having to piece together how did they get in, where did they go, what have they done already to help inform the where might they be going and who might this really be and what might they be after. So that defense in depth, I think, is an interesting one. And I, I think some encouragement to blue teams out there that may be going through these things, right? The goal shouldn't, in my opinion, be keep them out, get them right at the door. The goal is to ultimately detect them and to prevent them from accomplishing objectives on goal. And Yep. Yeah, you may not want to have to say that you had an event. I don't think any CISO, any CEO wants to go out and say that. But at the end of the day, they didn't accomplish anything is the real yeah. objective. So you've got this right. entire campaign to detect and prevent them from accomplishing their final goal. Um, you know, I'm curious your perspectives on that, right? How have you seen that work? It, Matt, are people still concerned about you just got to keep them out or have we matured past that point? Um, same question, I guess, for you too, Owen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, go ahead, Owen, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I, I think if anything, what MITRE has in particular has brought to the table is, uh, I mean, before we had the general attack timeline, right? The five or six stages that kind of mapped out what an attack is. But now MITRE has really broken that down, fine grain, right? To where now if you don't detect them or prevent them at, at the gates, right? And it's a couple stages back, at least you know where they're at, right? Where they're at in their their possible attack, and that allows you to take action quicker. If anything, it brings light to, oh, okay, we're seeing that outbound connection, um, you know, over a, a you know a non unique port that's happening right now. Well, they could be doing this or that, right? We we're able to quickly identify: are they doing data exfil, or are they just trying to simply establish that C two? and they actually haven't gotten goods yet, right? It, it allows you to quickly identify where they may be in that attack timeline. Um, so really, I mean, at the end of the day, that's even just understanding MITRE and understanding some of the, the techniques and sub-techniques, it brings to the forefront of your mind that mentality of, um, you know, okay, we need to obviously stop them, but then going back and, and after, you know, you're doing your documentation and reporting, you can then learn from, you know, some of the mistakes or, or the misses you may have had early on. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great point, you know, about the miter and the, the breaking down of the, the minutia per se of the process, whereas before it was just kind of like a high level bad person does thing and then they win. And this is like, you know, the bumps in the road. Now we have introspection into, okay, what's the process? And again, going back to that great CTI being a driver, 
we now kind of know, hey, all right, so once they get their initial access, what's their MO? Well, we've trained against this. We know what, what IOCs slash TTPs or whatever to look for. Um, you know, in the pyramid of pain, per se, uh, taking into consideration, you know, the difficulty of detections and things, right? So all of that to say, you know, I think that at the end of the day, that it's it's one of those things where that that defense in depth is going to be going to be key because again, like you were saying, Will, like we might get in, we might even get you know privilege escalation on on the box, and then heaven forbid we find some like you know administrative credentials, and now we're like thinking, oh, we're into money, but then we have to do something within the network to utilize that, right? We have to pivot. We have to identify, you know, something that would be of high value. Maybe we do some curb roasting, you know, maybe we do some, you know, some, some user account, you know, investigation, things like that. Those things will then start to build that profile and kind of like what Owen was saying, you know, what the, the miter breakdown is and you might say, okay, well, this, uh, this is kind of weird. Someone tried to RDP into this box and it's not the user that normally does it. Why would they do that? Huh? That's funny. And now they're requesting all of like the service principal names in the network. Huh. That's weird. And then ding. Uh, this might be bad. Let's see if what else is going on, you know, within the network. Oh, we've seen something similar in another box. Okay. This looks like Fin7. Let's go after them. Okay, cool. Pl- run our playbooks, do our thing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then that's how you win, right? Because to your point, we might get in an initial hold. We might start to do stuff, start to build out our infrastructure. So we're still in a very vulnerable state. You know, we want to you know, get the first bite in, right, and then let the poison run its course. Then it spreads. So if you stop that spread, and you're like, all right, well, we'll turn and get the wound, and then we'll you know address it accordingly. Like that stops us from being able to meet our objective, and then ultimately stops us in the end. So rather have ultimately to the point. <laughs> The email detections didn't work, but we stopped them versus, you know, the email detections worked, but they were so quick at what they did. And we had no detections beyond that. We just knew that we had been breached and then it was over. Like, which would you rather have? I know which right. one I would rather have. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great point, Matt. And, and definitely a fat lot of good if you detected them initially, but they're already all over the place and they've already accomplished objectives on goals because you just didn't have the infrastructure in place to stop them from moving from that point forward. Yeah. I wonder... So once the exercise is done, right, it's, it's job over. We're finished. We pack up. We go home. We did a good job, and there, there's no outcome for that. We, we practice. We sparred. Yay, we're done. Yep, yeah. that's it. Oh, 110. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think um, that's when the job begins. I think that's when you're really getting the value out of it. You you've done the exercise. Um, you know, as long as as you've had, you know, you have a way to to recall up, upon the events. You know, with your logs and whatnot. Um, then, you know, begins, you know, documentation, there's going to be several different documents from the defensive side, you're going to have to create. Um, I'm sure there'll be a gap analysis that you'll have to create and, and then you present get to that. Oh, and you get to create all you that get work. to create it. That's right. Okay. <laughs> and you'll have to present that at some point to senior leadership as well, you know, so that they can tell you, oh, you should fix that stuff. <laughs> and, um, I mean, and, and then from there, it's just, you know, a continuous improvement process. Then you're, you're taking those gaps and you're sitting down with your team and going, okay, what do we need to do? Do we need to, you know, create additional detections or do we need to actually, you know, put controls or additional layers in place to prevent this in general? Oh, they use PowerShell. It, oh, it was, a, it was a, a general user off their local, their not even local admin account, just their regular local account was able to run PowerShell. Well, that's a problem. Maybe we should revisit that. And further, you know, restrict down across the organization who can actually execute PowerShell. You know, I'd rather have a group of, you know, nine or ten admins, you know, having that ability versus, uh, you know, half the the IT team. So, I mean, Tom you know, and Mark things like that. Need to run PowerShell to enumerate users in the Active Directory domain, uh, Matt? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan of that, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> initial access, right, and, and doing that stuff. The reporting part and the fixing it, to Owen's point, I'm not as much of a fan of it then. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just dovetailing off what you're saying, Owen, like that's really when the work begins. Um, yeah. You know, we have identified what the gaps were, right? Where where was the failure in the process, per se? Well, failure is a strong word. But where was the, the misses, right, yeah, in miss. regards to the process? And then – how do we engineer that? And like, again, with the true purple team exercise, we're going to be coupling very closely 
to make sure that that detection engineering works. So, you know, in previous places that I've worked at, you know, there was a thing called like echo testing, right? You know, where you have like uh, essentially you, you have your detection, you want to validate the detection works. You're like, can you hear me now? Okay, you can't. Can you hear me now? You can't. Can you hear me now? Oh, I heard that. Okay, cool. You know, like, well, do you know where I am in the network? Do you know what, how this should be firing? Do you have the right information that you need to be able to effectively use this alert? Because I'm sure Owen can speak to this as an effective alert can, has to, has to give you certain bits of information for you to build, you know, that kind of, okay, well, what's going on here? Instead of it just being a thing happened, well, then it's just noise. And noise doesn't help. That actually contributes to the problem because when you have thousands of alerts going off and you're used to just turning your brain off because, you know, well, we we put these in because we were supposed to because a thing happened and then a dog looked at a cat, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Like that doesn't help the situation at all, right? So now you have all this noise flying around. The blue team's like panicking because they're like, well, we should catch adversary simulation or adversary emulation running their, their tests and stuff like that. But we're drowning in alerts, you know, I've heard that statement before, which is drowning in alerts. There's tons of stuff going on. So engaging to make sure those alerts are effective. Um, you know, and another thing too from the from from the red team side is the postmortem and the debrief is important. Making sure that there's a technical enough depth and and doing a number of those, road showing, you know, maybe what you did. Because it might be that, you know, Owen picks it up perfectly, but then like there's a sister team, like in digital forensics, that they don't, they don't get looped into this stuff normally, like Owen was talking about in the beginning of the podcast. And so, hey, let's show it to them. We want everyone to know what we did so that everyone has some sort of knowledge. So somebody can get something out of the communication outside of this, the detection engineering, the validation of the controls. That's, that's a great point. I mean, we're, I was just thinking even just from the security perspective, but there's going to be people outside of your team that are going to have to be looped in depending on the severity. And it is good to also include those tests with an engagement as well. I mean, you got your incident response team, got your compliance team, legal, you know, all that, all, they all have a, a place within, you know, certain severities, you know, breaches. Um, so it, it is important to have that proper communication channel and documentation that, yeah. you know, you, everyone knows when to loop them in. Because if you loop them in too early, it just it can get messy. Like you want you want to make sure that you're following those proper procedures as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that can be a tough one, right, Owen? From the from the yes. IR side of it, like when do I actually call the CEO in the middle of? The night? <laughs> like that's probably a good decision structure to have already worked out and to yes. know when when yes, when no. Because in the moment, I don't know that anybody in the hot seat on the IR team in the evening is going to go. Oh, I'll just call and wake them up. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely agree that the, these these exercises can be much larger than just the defensive and the, the ADSEM teams working together. They can be organizational wide. Um, exercises where legal, PR, um, many, many other teams are involved to really test the capabilities of the organization yeah. across the spectrum, not just from the technical standpoint. I think that's a, a really important call out um, that these things can be really, really expansive to include much, much more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, if, I've been in engagements too, where you just, do, that's all you do. You do a tabletop as well. You know, you do, yeah. you end up doing the technical side of it, but then you also bring everyone involved in a room. You sit down yeah. and you go, okay, this happened. What do we do next? Oh, we contact legal. Okay, great. What does legal do? You know, and you just, you make everyone walk through it. And that's yeah. also a great exercise that can be dovetailed off of, you know, uh, an engagement like this one. Yeah, I know it's interesting, uh, Matt, out. you called this out and when you confirmed it, it's probably something I hadn't really th thought of, but I think it's important, right? So you do this exercise in a purple team fashion, you do lessons learned, Owen goes in and he's putting in new detections and that's not the end of it either, right? It's like, okay, well, I put the detection in, Did, did I, can I detect them? And it's interesting. So the, the blue team is not an adversary simulator. They don't know all of these tools, but I know we failed at that thing. I know we put detections in, but let's not stop there. Let's make sure that the detection actually worked. And then, oh, and I know you talked about this a little bit before, but um, I think another interesting next step is correlation, right? To help prevent some of that alert fatigue. So we got the detection in place, but we know because we did this campaign, these were the things that were going on before and after, and these are what the general patterns look like. So if we see this thing, and these other things, then we can engineer the solution in the SIM and our EDR to help give us more context and correlation to know we've seen this before. These pieces are falling together in a very well-known way that is a bigger indicator other than 
Tom in marketing happens to open PowerShell by mistake because he clicked on it. Right. It didn't anything. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You'll you'll find a lot of those, and that's why it is important to bring in that CTI and your threat intelligence and even additional data sources to allow your sim to really do what it's intended to do and, and correlate. It's not just an alert tool. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought it was just central logging. Well, it can be if, if you don't set it up properly. <laughs> it can be a, your alarm clock and whatever else you need it for. Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess any lessons learned here at kind of at the, the, the top of the hour here for us, um, as you were going through this campaign and, and Owen, you were having to tolerate Matt and Matt, you were having to deal with Owen, um, you know, in building this campaign, what did you learn? What did you walk away from in, in the creation of it? that was interesting to you that you might not have expected. Yeah. Um, right on. Sorry. No. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, it was good. I think the first couple, um, uh, segments that we did, uh, it was definitely a little bit more back and forth. Um, I know we, we had, obviously we had some issues up front, I think, you know, with the SIM itself, but once we got those ironed out, um, it was definitely the communication was key. I mean, you know, I went through uh, one of the engagements there that we were doing, and I didn't even know that Matt was actually using port 666 to to go outbound. You know, I was looking through, combing through all the logs, and then, you know, he provided me with that context. I was like, oh, it's right in front of my face, and I didn't even know it. So, uh, you know, definitely, um, and then that that ironed itself out through the late, you know, the, the latter courses for sure that, I, you know, I just came to him up front, you know, hey, I'm, I, I'm looking at this, this, and this, am I on the right track? He'd say, yes, you are. Give me a thumbs up or whatever, you know, little dance emoji, um, to let me know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm on the right path. Um, and definitely the, uh, the, uh, the Rick roll, uh, from the ransomware, um, <laughs> was, it was a huge sign that I was on the right track. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In all yeah, fairness, so into you too, right? So you, your, your security engineering, the, <laughs> the entire security environment as we, Cyberary, have built out this first campaign, which is yeah. no small amount of work. I know Matt and I both, um, I got way deeper into Elk on Docker than I ever thought I was ever going to get. <laughs> um, and I think we all learned a lot. But again, and I'll do deference to you, Owen, you, we, we were building the entire environment from the ground up. And Matt just got yep. to come in and break it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, and I was gonna say my job was a little bit easier. I got to have like the fun, but you know, um, in regards to lessons learned, a lot of stuff like what Owen was saying, communication, driving it, you know, and then also some of the stuff that I thought would have been caught very, you know, very quickly and easily based off the environment wasn't so much. So, you know, there's a lot of small things that you pick up as you, you know, you iterate through it. So, um, it was it was a great learning experience. I had a ton of fun, obviously, as yep. you can tell with some of the, the stuff that I threw out there, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to the next one, you know, because uh, they're a lot of fun. I think it's a great transfer of knowledge. Uh, Owen's great to work with. Like you said, he's super sharp. And like, he's like, oh, well, I have to engineer detections for all of this on my own. All right. Uh, I guess I'll get to it. Well, and <laughs> so, I'm learning stuff too along the way. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know MITRE inside and out yet. You know, I'm learning as I go and they're constantly adding content as well. So oh, yeah. it, it's been a great learning experience. Yeah, Miter's Miter's doing a great job of keeping the framework up to date and is on cadence to continue to update the framework every six months. And some of those are minor and some of those are really substantial, like the latest update yeah. rolled back in some of the changes that they seemingly reversed in their data sources, which I was really puzzled by. But hmm. my read of it, it all ends up going back to the, the 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 taxonomy and how they're relating all that data to make it more useful and usable both for human and machine readable but it was it was a little weird the version before it's like wait what did you do with data sources that was a great yeah. pool of knowledge yeah. to go if you're looking for this particular technique here's a bunch of data sources that you yep. should consider and then it kind of quietly moves away and i'm happy to see that it moving back in and yeah in a new way in a, in a more data centric uh, way um again I, Miners continuing to grow and learn. I think we all will have to continue to grow and learn to keep up because the adversaries like Matt are continuing to do the same and they always want to get after the crown jewels one way or another. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you both so much. This has been a lot of fun. I fully expect that as more campaigns roll out on the Cyberary platform, I know we've got two really interesting ones in the works right now that Matt's already built the, the ad sim plans for and Owen's building out the detections and everything for. So we're moving ahead with... With a lot of anticipation about the next ones coming out, we're going to continue to pour into that particular body of content, to Matt's point, that 
it really is a great transfer of knowledge and it is a lot of fun uh, to build oh, yeah. as well. We're going to be doing a lot more and I hope to have Matt, you and Owen both on the show again relatively soon to talk about the next awesome. adversary that we're going to knock out. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, thank Thanks you. guys. Take care.